Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. A very warm welcome to Meet Menaka episode 43, Realigning Business and Career with Hiru Shotia. Today, I have to start with this quote from Maya Angelou. We delight in the beauty of the butterfly, but rarely admit the changes it has gone through to achieve the beauty. That's the quote which reminds me of Hiru. <laughs> we all know these are unprecedented times for individuals and businesses worldwide, particularly given the changes we had to go through because of COVID-19. In such difficult time, we are often reminded that resilience can help us, but can it also hinder us is a question we will be discussing today. Before we dive into it, let me introduce today's speaker, Hiru Shotia. She's an entrepreneur, business strategist and mentor, executive coach, international business consultant, keynote speaker, and a contributor to various trade and consumer publications. In 1995, she launched a company, IBD Limited, and a further brand, Grow Your Business Successfully, in 2013. He hosts the podcast, The Business Growth Mastery Show, featuring entrepreneurs, thought leaders, and business experts who share their breakthroughs, challenges, as well as their journeys to success. She's also the author of Seven Reasons Entrepreneurs Succeed in Business and her latest release, Ignite. Five proven strategies for sparking successful, scalable, and sustainable businesses. An international bestseller in two business categories in seven countries. Hiru lives in London. Hiru is also passionate about eradicating homelessness, which is so devastating and can be a result of so many other social issues. She has worked with homeless charities and organizations for the last 40 years for this cause. More than all this, I take pride in calling Hiru my friend for the resilience she has shown and compassion she often demonstrates, be it be in a group, be it be in her community, or anywhere you find Hiru, you can see compassionate kindness coming through. So a very warm welcome to Hiru. Thank you, Monica. What a lovely introduction and lovely words that you added there. Um, I want to first of all thank you for inviting me to your show. I'm delighted to be um, sharing my perspectives uh, with your audience. Thank you. Thanks, Hiro. So before we go into the subject matter, Hiro, can I ask you, is there anything that accelerated the need for realignment in career and business for you personally? It most certainly did, and there's certainly an example or two I can give you. Um, so just to give you a bit of background, because I think some of my um, responses will make sense when you when you know my history. Um, I was, uh, as Manika says, I set up my business some years ago. I was in good health, um, really enjoying my business, um, sort of almost 14 years into my business. I'd in grown my business into an international um, consulting and coaching business based from the UK, but working with international clients as well. And we were doing really, really well. Um, I had just returned from a well-earned holiday uh, from abroad, um, feeling very refreshed, feeling, feeling really good, and was rushing to the second client of the day um, uh, on a Monday morning. And I actually fell um, very hard on the street. And after a few tests and some weeks, what was thought to be a relatively simple cartilage problem, um, which they thought was the likelihood for the fall, turned out to be diagnosed as both a chronic and a degenerative illness. Um, as you can imagine, my life was turned upside down at this point. I'm an eternal optimist, so I just thought, well, whatever it is, they're going to, you know, in this current day and age, they're going to find a solution. I'm going to get back to work fairly quickly and life will go on as it was. A few minor changes, but that's what will happen. Unfortunately, what started out as days of um, going into hospital turned into months, months turned into years of hospital visits, operations and procedures. And 
it was undoubtedly one of the most difficult periods in my entire life. Um, I think it would be fair to say that each day I felt um, everything that I had worked for, everything I'd achieved on a personal level, on a professional level, was slipping away further and further. I had a tremendous responsibility towards the people who worked for us. Um, and whilst we managed to keep everything juggling for the first couple of years, it was extremely difficult to sustain that level of business that we'd got used to as my health just got worse and worse. And whilst they tried lots of different issues and procedures to try and resolve it. And in fact, it was almost six years in total in what I term as my wilderness years um, of each day um, trips to hospitals, etc. And throughout this period, I would ask my consultants, and there were many, <laughs> um, when I could go back to work. Each day I would ask the same question. I'm sure they were thoroughly sick of me by this time, because I, each time they would tell me that I needed to have a much more realistic perspective of life from now on. Um, and effectively, I was not going to go back to the life I had, or indeed um, the job I had. So, although inherently a very optimistic person, it was a very demoralizing period in my life and a very devastating one. So I hope that gives you some context and I hope that answers your question, Menika. Sure, of course it does. It's, you know, of course I know your circumstances, I know your personal background, but this is to illustrate for everyone else, you know, this is not uncommon anymore. Things mm -hmm. happen, changes happen. If not, you know, last year we all experienced how, you know, drop of the hat, these things can happen. So I think it's really important for us to start understanding life does throw the curveballs, you know, more often than we expect. Absolutely. So I know, you know, resilience is the word for the year by Ariana Huffington this uh, year, and I agree. But how and why resilience can work for and against you? What are your thoughts about it? Because I think, uh, personally, prevention and proactive support and help, uh, along with focus on each one's own mental fitness is absolutely key to having resilience. But it is also, I think, important to understand as a whole picture, you know, what resilience can do, cannot do, and how and why sometimes it's taken a bit too seriously and too far. So what, see, what, what are your thoughts about it? You know. I, I completely agree with everything you've said, um, Menika. Um, <laughs> I'm going to, I suppose I'm going to talk, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my sort of love and hate relationship with resilience. Sure. And I, I know that sounds a bit odd, but um, I think perhaps it would make sense if I explain what, how I've come about that thought. Um, I think, first of all, the word resilience, and you've sort of touched upon it, is quite difficult to define. And, dif and, and I say that because it's so different for everyone, and it's also difficult to measure. So what I mean by that, I mean, that for some people, resilience is um, doing well, say, in the face of some form of adversity I've often heard it said that you know that's mm -hmm. often been said to me you you know you, you 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 can do well in the face of adversity if you are resilient but just that sentence to me is so subjective um, and depends on who you are because doing well and adversity those two words can mean so many different things to different people and also in different cultures for instance sure. you know um, so that in itself, I think, is why I have a little bit of an issue with resilience. That's my first issue that it, you know, we, we take it as read that everybody understands what we mean by resilience and everybody accepts that definition. And it can be very different for different people. Um, and then when it comes to measuring it, how do we know what resilience, uh, how to measure resilience? How do we know, for instance, that we are um, 
good at resilience? How do we know when it's running out in us? How do you know when it's succeeding in us? Some people say, for instance, and have said to me that it's when we still have hope. When I've asked that question, I've, I've asked people questions about this many times and said, what does it mean to you? And they've said, well, I've still got hope. Some people have said it's when it, I, it's in the sort of absence of any regret that I may have. Or others have said things like the ability, I, my ability to look back and see why I've, what I've overcome. Well, I guess for me, it's a combination of all those things, but in different measures. And I think if I'm being very honest at different times of my life. Um, so my love hate relationship that I've just referred to, um, the sort of hate bit, I guess, is because the definition, um, people have perceptions, and I think we need to, to question those perceptions from, from our own point of view. Um, but if you're perceived as being resilient, um, and, and I certainly I can tell you that that's people's perception of me often, I believe it can work against you many times as it has done in my case. So when I was at my lowest in terms of my health as well as my business, I felt incredible pressure to make things work as others expected it of me because they thought I was resilient. Um, she's just, you know, you hear these terms, she's just gonna bounce back. She'll be fine, she'll bounce back, you know, and the same was thought of about the business. Oh, don't worry, you know, it's, it's only been a couple of months, but she'll be back. She'll be doing her, you know, she'll get it back to international status. She'll do this, she'll do that. So when you're not well, those sort of expectations can be very damning. Um, it's, it's, on the one hand, it's reassuring that people believe in you. On the other hand, the pressure builds up hugely. So that's, my, that's where I don't really sure. care for resilience. But on the other hand, shall I move on to the, 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 the positive or do you want of to course, Of course, of course, because I was about to say, I can totally relate to you because, yeah. you know, um, you know, because, uh, you know, I have been told many times, oh, you're strong. Oh, you know, you will be okay. But, you know, sometimes it's okay not to be okay. And, you know, people around you have to be able to understand that. Precisely, precisely. I mean, I think... I'm torn between those comments, um, Menika. I completely agree with you. When I was unwell, some part of my brain did need to hear those words, you're strong. It's the left latter half and you'll be okay, worried me because I thought, yeah, I know I'm strong, but can I make it back to where I was? You know, there was an expectation, not only would I make it to where I was, but I'd exceed. And it was that, constant pressure and as you've just said what's really really important is that people mean well but do they understand and we I could be just as guilty when I'm supporting somebody else who's going through difficulties that by saying those words am I raising their stress levels unduly so not to be okay is okay as you've just rightly said um, it's really really important that we we are able to um recognize that and be supportive of people who are not doing okay and and allowing them not to be okay during that yeah. period yeah. i resonate with it so much because exactly like you said it's good to hear that you would be great and you'll recover but at the meantime i think it's a balance people have to understand when to say what and also, I think when people are perceived, like you say, mm -hmm. um, you know, they are strong or they're resilient or, you know, whichever other terminologies you like and use, sometimes, you know, they have undue disadvantage, I feel, because they are nurturing and supporting someone else in the family or in the environment or in the workplace because they see themselves as not as strong are not as resilient and yeah. they feel that they this you know they're obliged to support that person more than the other person who is perceived strong but you know we are all humans we all have different emotions we all have different circumstances and i think it's really important you know there's no one you know you know you can't just label them this person is strong and this person is not strong i think we have to evaluate every circumstance carefully would you agree Hiro? i i totally totally agree and i think 
you know, I've talked about how other people's um, comments mm -hmm. and behaviors affected me, but I haven't talked about my own. Um, and you saying what you've just said, Manika, has just reminded me that actually, I think sometimes I'm my worst enemy because I am, I am, I am quite a strong individual, that is true. And I'm very stubborn, <laughs> as you will no doubt have gathered from the way I've, I've tackled this. And I'll come back to my stubbornness later. But, um, and I'm, you know, I am also an internal optimist and I see that as a strength. But during those hard times, that eternal optimism also put even more pressure on me. So I, I put more pressure on myself because I did not allow myself to think that failure, um, as I perceived it. I was about to say I, perceived that, failure. <laughs> I perceived it. My failure was acceptable. The, the reality was that every day I was not, it, it was exactly the opposite. I was not failing. I was actually achieving. Every day I was getting a little bit stronger, but I did not perceive that in myself. I perceived it as failure um, because this is the stubbornness. I was not willing to let go of what I was and what I had been. And th so there was a real tussle. I'm the optimist, so everything's going to be fine. I'm just going to have to work at it differently. Um, the stubbornness was, I don't want to do anything differently. I like my life as it is. <laughs> so I was constantly pulling and tugging in different directions. Um, so it wasn't just other people's failure to understand my, me and what I was going through and their expectations. It was very much my own as well. And I think I was my worst um, sort of case <laughs> um, and an example of what not to do. And it took me a very, very long time to accept this. And when I say a very long time, I'm talking about years. I just wasn't ready. I can totally resonate with this because the word which comes to mind is realistic opti optimism, isn't it? <laughs> that is, you know, that has to be the case and which I am not very good at as well sometimes. And, uh, you know, Viktor uh, Frankl actually speaks about this, mm. uh, you know, optimi how opti optimism can go against you uh, because people who thought, oh, this December we will be out of the uh, camp, they, they actually, there was a study done and they lost, the loss of lives were, more amongst them because they were totally disheartened because they thought by December they will be out when they weren't out or they couldn't be and it kind of broke them. So I yeah. think um, the one lesson I have also learned is be optimistic, but be realistic. Optimism is good. Yeah, I agree. I think it that realism is really needed, um, though optimism is really important to me as well. On a personal level, I have to have something to work towards, you know, um, as I was really, really unwell in those days in hospital, I, I had to have something to hold on to. However, sometimes unrealistic it was, I had to have something. But as I got better, what was very apparent to me was that it had, I had to be the realistic optimist. I couldn't just be the optimist, nor could I just give up as that wasn't me. So I could, I, if I was going to function, um, in any shape or form that was acceptable to me, I had to find that realism. Yes. I think when you have the realism and optimism, it allows you to course correct in time, isn't it? Because Absolutely. rather than being in that, uh, you know, a denial and uh, thinking, you know, I think there it's, it's like a fork, isn't it? You want someone can be denial and be in a victim state, but wherever the other person can be totally op optimistic and still be in denial. So it's exactly. like, you know, two extremes. <laughs> Yeah. And you need to find that common ground and balance between the two. And I think it's so easy. You know, when I say those words now um, that one needs to find the balance, you know, it, it can take years as it did in my case. I mean, I had a lot of variables going on. My health would get better, then it would get worse, then it would get better, then it would get worse. And each time that realistic optimism had to keep dipping and diving um, to fit in with the, the health issues as well. And of course, mindset. Of course, I can, you know, with someone who has gone through the mental health ups and downs, and you have seen me at that time as well, and I can, you know, see how it can affect you. So moving on from there, 
Why do you think resilience is key to business success in the age of so, COVID-19? Can I just give you the, the positives? I only talked about my hate bit. <laughs> can I just add the love bit so I can balance it slightly? And then I'll come back to your question, if I may. So one of the other things, though, um, what I found was that, as I said, I, I am not a downer on resilience, but I had this issue with it. But as I got better, um, and in fact, while I was ill, I did a lot of research in true hero fashion um, <laughs> on um, uh, you know, the experiences people were going through, because I wanted to understand, is, I didn't know much about um, facing trauma of any kind, you know, I mean, in the sense you, you're sympathetic to people who have trauma, but on a personal level, I didn't really know much about it. So I did quite a lot of research and to my amazement, um, quite a lot of the research shows that at least 75% of people will have one or more traumatic event in their lifetime. I mean, that's quite considerable. And the concept of traumatic event is quite broad, but nonetheless. But what was really, really encouraging to read was that despite the fact that most of these traumatic events will event inevitably cause a lot of suffering, hurt, whatever it is your trauma brings with it, that for many, many people that they had... Um, research uh, uh, in as part of their trials what they found was that the trauma could also be a force for positive change and when I read that it was almost like the tilting and balancing of my thoughts you know I'd, up to that point I just kept thinking for goodness sake you know stop telling me I'm strong and I'm resilient I can't handle this anymore but then as I started to move through those years I thought well actually I could move this to become more positive for me. I could if I wanted to, but I had to be the one to make that change. Um, so I used, if you like, I was at the right juncture in my illness, if you like, to use that as a catalyst for doing something different and having a more positive outcome for myself, which I had read other people had also managed. And for me though, it was about recognizing and acknowledging both the positive and the negative aspects of resilience. So just to, to finish that bit off, I'm not against resilience, but I do think we have to be very realistic. I think the definitions are very different for everyone and it can be a positive aspect. Sure. Thanks, uh, Hiro, because, you know, resilience is a big word for me and everyone mm. on the show have heard me speak about resilience all the time and, mm. you know, exactly what you said. So for me, I think understanding people, empathizing, showing compassion for other people's situations or stories or strengths is something I thought I always had. And other people have commented upon this several times. However, I have learned so much more um, about this through my mental health challenges, changing careers, becoming an entrepreneur, being a woman leadership in the past two decades in different contexts. So my process of understanding people um, or demonstrating empathy and being open to their vulnerabilities have shaped the way I uh, connect with other people to inspire or communicating uh, or sharing information or how to create a communities for positive impact. I think this, I think the experiences we go through undoubtedly will change and fuel the rest of the work that we do and the path we carve out. Do you um, agree, Hiro? Yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, to be honest, um... I feel that all our experiences, irrespective, just parking resilience for a second, but I think all our experiences impact on how we feel, how we behave um, and should do. Um, sometimes I think though, we, we, we sort of park those and, and, and leave those behind, you know, some, especially if they've been difficult um, situations that we've faced, we don't normally all, bring that to the fore when we are empathizing with other people because we may appear vulnerable and society doesn't always um favor <laughs> yeah, doesn't always favor those who are perceived to be vulnerable in the way that they interact on a personal level I think 
vulnerability is a strength and can be a strength. It's how you use that vulnerability. If you're constantly victimizing yourself, I don't think that's necessarily helpful. But showing your vulnerability, and by that I mean showing that you can fail, showing that you are in pain or whatever it is, you know, can open you up to a better interaction with the other person. And hopefully that person um, then can re relate to their own vulnerabilities and respond, which is what you're saying, Menika. Sure, sure. Thanks, Hiro. So going back to the question yeah. that I asked <laughs> first, <laughs> that's okay. Why resilience is key to business success in the age of COVID-19 particularly? Okay, so I think I'm going to talk about why resilience is key to business success first and then why to, specifically to COVID-19 because, um, frankly, as you know, Manika, as a businesswoman in your own right, um, resilience, if we take it in, this, in the widest um, sort of definition, is necessary when you are in business for yourself, whether as a woman or a man, um, as, you know, if, if, if you're going to be successful, because we all go through troubled times in our businesses, whether you are successful, moderately successful or not successful, you will have difficult and challenging times in your business. That's just the nature of business. Um, and you will have to go through those um, difficulties and weather the storm and have strategies in place to deal with that. Where as a business coach and a mentor, um, I often see this going wrong is when individuals have not really thought this through and so they are trying to develop those strategies on the hoof. If you come from a mindset that says I am I'm in business or you know I'm in a high profile situation you might be in corporate um, situation you might be working for yourself you might be in a professional capacity but you, if you come from it a mindset that says you know, everything every day cannot go right. And I'm going to have a mindset which allows me to have developed some strategies of how to deal with those in advance of the adversities, you are going to be much more likely to ride that wave. Now, this is even more relevant um, in the uh, current COVID age that we are in, when so many people, if we're talking about business, as your question was, have taken such an incredible hit on their livelihoods as, and they've been either the livelihoods have been taken away altogether or they've altered dramatically or are likely to alter dramatically as we move forward because a lot of people have been cushioned up till now depending on which country you're in. Um, so I think rather than wait for the worst case scenario to hit us, what we're requiring to do, and in the COVID age, this is absolutely imperative is that we need to think through what the worst case scenarios are likely to be for ourselves we need to develop that resilience and that's something we haven't talked about yet we've talked about people who are perceived as being resilient but i don't believe that you are necessarily inherently born resilient it is something that you can develop it's something you can work towards um, and you certainly in business um, just as you can in your personal life, frankly, start to develop that resilience. But that comes from having a mindset and strategies in advance. It's not going to work. If, the, you know, just the analogy that tomorrow my, I have a major leak in my home and the, and the roof caves in, you know, if I'm not resilient as an individual to begin with, or I don't have some resilient strategies, frankly, I'm not going to know what to do and I'm going to really struggle. And it's no different in the pandemic situation. And those that are surviving the pandemic are those that have actually got those strategies or at least some strategies developed um, for the adversities. Thanks, Hiro. But, you know, I think, you know, resilience is really important. I think particularly in the business sense, do you think like being able to be creative, uh, to be able to contribute to others and be able to collaborate rather than compete, adapt. Yep. And, you know, I think these are the things a lot of good business leaders have demonstrated over, over this yeah, time, right? Absolutely. Um, I mean, to be honest, my, you know, if the, 
most of the work that I've done with my clients during this pandemic has been to help them to pivot their businesses into another form. Because I would say that, and this is across the globe, to be honest, this is not just in the UK, mm. because for at least 50% of, the, of my clients, what they were doing pre-pandemic, they cannot do exactly the same. They can either do it tweaked or they have to change their business model altogether. So whether you're in a pandemic or not, I would say that as business owners, you do need to be quite agile and think yeah. about that. And in some cases, you know, it's going to be more difficult than others. If you're, you know, um, I'll take your example, Menika, forgetting the other aspects of your work, but as a dentist, you are a dentist, you know, but you may offer your services in different ways. Up till now, traditionally, everyone would come to see a dentist in their, in their um, premises. Sure. We went through periods where nothing was open. But there's nothing to stop a dentist giving advice online. It's not the best form of uh, your, the treatment, perhaps. It's not the best thing you could have offered, but it's some form of treatment. It's not everything you could have offered, but you could have helped some people in some ways. And it's thinking about that creativity and that agility in your business. Sure. Thank you, Hiro, because, you know, that's how actually the, the pathway led to the talk show, because uh, two of the dentists in India, they were really lost and they were stressed out and they reached out to me saying, what can we do? The practices are closed. Both of them were practice owners. And I said, OK, but it doesn't stop you from doing video consultations or, you know, exactly. you know giving, uh, for example, a temporary uh, you know, filling material just to pack them and give that to, to them, or for example. So you could could do all those things and that's how you know I started the group coaching from India and um, uh, you know UK and uh, some people in the Middle East and then it led to you know one of the coaching sessions I said oh you know we have to do something the mental health is going through the roof and that's how we started the precisely what you said it is being able to adapt and yeah. I think it is also important as an organization level, or particularly if you're a leader, to understand that individual resilience and collective sustainability of the organization is closely intertwined, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, which will help you to then course uh, correct in real time and prevent the issues coming up or navigate through the change uh, or the, without delay can help if organizations um, are mindful of resilience to begin with of the organization and individual people there. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with you. Um, I think the key word there, though, is the shift to leader. I think the biggest problem um, owners, business owners make, and often even in industry, to be honest, because I, as you said in my introduction, I executive coach as well, senior C-suite members, mm -hmm. is that for many, it's that disparity between being a business owner and being a business leader. All the things that you've just described, Menika, are what business leaders do. They, they move their business on, they react they in, in real time, as you said, mm -hmm. and they course correct and they develop strategies and they move the business and start moving in the right direction. It may take a few course corrects, but you're, that's what a business leader does. A business owner is something that you, you know, that's your title um, when you own your business, but it doesn't really describe your functions in the, in the business. And that's where a lot of people get stuck. It's, you know, you can be a one man business owner, but if you want to develop your business, you've got to move into the leadership role. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I often say, you know, you can't call yourself a leader or owner if you, you don't have anybody to follow. Is it, it's as simple as that. <laughs> yes, you know, uh, the, the, I would agree. I completely agree there. But the only thing that I would just make a slight clarification there is that in, that I'm not talking about having to employ lots of people. Yeah. You know, you can, have, sure. you can be a good leader, mm -hmm. but still have a very small cohort of people who work with you. And they don't, none of them even have to be employed by you. You sure. could be outsourcing your work, but yeah. you could be a good leader. Yeah, but I think it's as a leader, as it, rightly you said, because you are the captain of whether even if you're not employing them, you should be able to show the way 
pay with absolutely. the plot. Absolutely, absolutely. You, you, they are looking to you to create a culture for your organization. And as you say, create that path for them. And once you've done that, then you've created an, a sustainable resource in the organization that allows them to, um, you know, create the sort of business that you want and you've aimed for and your vision. Thanks, Hiro. For me personally, you know, resilience is about renewal, right? It is also about shedding what you don't necessarily need any longer or doesn't serve you. I think we have to have the willingness to reflect or remodel or renew uh, from, you know, learn from the shared, you know, experiences like how we had last year and, uh, you know, build from them and be able to collaborate. In your opinion, how it is best to realign your business after an unexpected personal or business trauma? Because I can't think of anyone better to ask this question. Okay, so we it, it's it's actually coming back to something we said before. I think if you're going to realign your business, irrespective of whether you've had um, a personal trauma like myself, or a business trauma or COVID generally in the country, it is about being realistic. Um, I told you what happened in my in my time in terms of my degenerative health problems, etc. But I'll give you my own example. I referred to the fact that I was very, very reluctant to let go. Um, and that was me really digging my heels in my stubbornness, not wanting to be realistic, not realizing that despite the fact that at that point I could not walk unaided at all, I still had these unrealistic expectations of what I could do. So being realistic when you're trying to realign is really, really important. I'm not talking about giving up on your dreams. I'm not talking about not achieving, but I am talking about being realistic in how we achieve those dreams. So one of the things I haven't told you um, as yet is that, I mean, in the introduction, you, you gathered that I did various things, but I also said that I had my reins pulled back quite substantially. But after six years of being in that wilderness, I started finally, finally to be realistic and very, very reluctantly agreed to give up my consulting work, international consulting work initially. And what I did was I realized that even though I had mobility problems, I could still do my coaching. I was lucky that I could, I still had something I could fall back on. And actually, it's not just me. I'll come back to that point. But I had the opportunity to coach. So I gave up my international consulting. I rebuilt a new business around the coaching. It was very slow to begin with. And it was stop start because I don't want to give you this impression it just happened overnight. Um, because, you know, my illness comes and goes and gets better and gets worse. And... I finally have developed another successful business. So it's being realistic about what you can do. Now, I want to come back to the point I just made about not just about me, but others. What I've found in this last two years around the pandemic, particularly, is that once I'm able to help my clients see, and friends, anyone see what the possibilities are, it is amazing how they are able to be realistic. So it's not that you can't, it's just that we, our mindset stops us from being realistic often. I have yet to find a single person where we haven't realigned their business in some shape or form, even if it's temporary, to um, overcome the unexpected business and or personal problems. Thanks, Hiro, because I think in personal life and in business life, as a person like you, you know, I have had my practice for 15 years now, and we always course correct and we always adapt, but perhaps at a slightly slower pace. And then particularly when something drastic happens, we think we have never done that. You know, suddenly we have to redo all the things, but, you know, we often forget we have been doing it all along, but in a very, uh, you know, the pace of doing it has been the only differentiator. 
Or, or maybe you just, yes, I completely agree with you. Some things we just have done at a different pace. Or if, if I'm being very honest, some things I never did and have had to do or did and no longer can. But it's, it's not that it's either or. It's a mixture of all those things. But being open to them is what's allowed me to move forward. Sure. Thanks, Hiro. So, you know, like there are some key habits of uh, successful entrepreneurs um, or successful business owners too. What is your opinion? How you might need to rethink your habits during COVID-19 in your opinion? Okay, so that's <laughs> great because all successful, let's talk about habits first in terms of successful entrepreneurs and then how we have to rethink those if indeed um, through the COVID. I'm, as you said at the beginning, I've written you know, about this issue because the research I've carried out many years ago indicated that all successful entrepreneurs, all successful entrepreneurs have daily habits and routines um, and this is very much part of their success, um, both personal and business success. And by that, I mean that, as an example, that they create habits for themselves on a daily basis. So they'll create things like downtime, whether it's exercise, whether it's um, uh, meditation, self-development time, um, and this is daily. So let's let's just break that down. It's not either or. So they'll do, you know, so if they commit to doing exercise, it'll be an exercise routine every single day. If it's meditation, it'll be meditation every single day. If it's self-development, they'll read a, you know, a, a paragraph or a, a chapter every single day. It's that um, ability to be really disciplined and having um, those sort of habits that creates success because you then have a very focused mind that says, okay, I'm not going to just let the whole day go by getting distracted by all sorts of things, whether it's work, personal, social media, whatever it is. I, I'm very focused. When I get up in the morning, I'm going to do this, this, this. And before my work starts, I'm going to do this, 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 this. I'm going to be very um, focuslessly, although there's a lot of work, I'm going to be prioritizing my work. So it's no different. And in fact, I would say it's even more important during the pandemic that we get our physical and mental focus from such habits. And if you haven't formed them, I would highly urge you to form small habits to begin with, you know, every day so that you can start to become very focused in your own mind and really succeed. Um, I mean, a, a real example in the pandemic is that we, many, many of us are forced to work from home still. And what I found is that the days are getting longer and longer. We don't have the travel time. So we think, oh, we get onto our desks early, which is great. But then the day is extending longer and longer. We're getting more stressed. We're sitting in front of our screens far too long. Um, and we are forgetting about the physical and mental um, habits that we should be performing um and they don't you know they don't all have to be the things that i mean maybe you love exercising and that's great because that'll be fun but they can be fun habits as well you know spending time doing fun things for yourself that's all part of that mental agility as well as mental focus that we are trying to create particularly at the moment around um covid19 uh, state that we're in, but generally around being successful. Sure. Thanks, Hiro. Because I think as a dentist, I can tell you this is what I tell my patients. You know, you can't, uh, you know, you come to the dentist every six months or every three months. And then, but you do have to brush your teeth every day for two minutes. Precisely. Right? <laughs> Isn't it? But if you, you can't just uh, brush for the entire day just before the appointment and come, it doesn't serve you anything. So you have to brush every day for two minutes. It's like, you know, going for a walk or doing some exercise for 10 minutes, five minutes, whatever, or doing the meditation in the morning. And, but I think including myself, I think we all sometimes fall into this trap of, you know, uh, doing too much or not doing at all. And I think it's really serves people well to get into that routine and you know I think it's an important point you raised there just one thing on the routine that I would want to say that for mm -hmm. people who are perhaps listening and thinking oh 
sounds like hard work. You only have to introduce one routine to begin with. And there's ample evidence to show that it only takes 21 days to really master it. And after yeah. that, it becomes a, a habit. Yeah, I think the latest evidence is um, from UCL is around 66 days. You know, I am no scientist. I have no idea, but I think I'm sure 21 days is more than enough. <laughs> well, the, all it happens is that after 21 days, you're not, not having to think about it so actively. Um, it just becomes part of your habit and routine. And a lot of neuroscientists will say, isn't it this high, you know, firing and uh, whatever, however it works. But, you know, it, it's like, you know, I'm sure, hope, I'm hoping as a dentist, particularly in the morning when you wake up, you don't th have to think and remind yourself that you had to brush your teeth. Like that, it becomes a norm when you keep doing that all the time. So, you know, the, I want to ask Hiro, like, why despite years of experience in each person's respective field, some, some uh, entrepreneurs or business owners fail in their business. Why do you think it is? I think that's because we as a society, irrespective of whether we're in the West or the East, to be honest, um, make some enormous assumptions. We train at um, colleges and universities in our key area of discipline. So whether you're a doctor, dentist, engineer, whatever it is, you know, you train in that field. And often people will then go into business for themselves. Uh, but your key area of discipline, doctor, whatever, does not necessarily make you a good business owner, let alone a good business leader. It's recognizing and developing very, very different skills. And that I think is the biggest reason why most entrepreneurs fail in their business, despite being, despite having years and years of fabulous experience in their own area of expertise. You know, it's, there's an enormous assumption. It's, it's a bit akin to, not quite as exaggerated, but a bit akin to the idea that when we are, when we're in corporate life, you know, we, we work up the ladder and we get to, you know, you're a, brilliant engineer say and they give you um, a department to manage and they wonder why you're not doing well <laughs> well what makes you think being a good engineer makes you a good manager there are two different skills involved sure. you know and the same is true but even more amplified when you have your own business because then you are juggling so many different aspects of your business and it can be overwhelming and quite stressful for a lot of business owners, who, why would you, as say, a doctor, be good at <laughs> marketing? Why would you, as a dentist, be good at marketing? Why would you be good at accounting, necessarily? You may be. You may be one of these people who have a lot of strengths, but we make an assumption that you're going to just fit into that slot of business owner with your years of experience in your discipline, and it's going to work. And that's the biggest reason most people fail. 100%. I really wrote, wrote about this in my book, uh, calling because having the technical skills and business skills are very different things and people don't often realize. So I want to, you know, um, ask as many questions as possible. So I'm going to move, <laughs> move on to ask, why are many business owners of, like who have products or services not selling when competitors with similar items are doing well? What do you think it's, it's, it's like a value added service or wh what is it? I would say that 99.95% .95 of the time, it's because their focus is on the wrong issues. And by that, I mean that they are trying to sell a product or a service that they are passionate about, but it doesn't necessarily meet the needs of the client groups that they're aiming at. So it's, it's so common to find people come along and say, you know, I've, I've got this great idea, I've got this great passion, of course that's fantastic, but is there a need for it? Do people wanna buy it? Um, another example might be, I'm gonna take your example, um, Menika. <laughs> Here you are, I, I don't mean you personally, but as a dentist, sure. you know, if you're a dentist and you're thinking of setting up a business, are you thinking about, you know, the locality? Are you thinking about 
the competition? Are you thinking about um, the demographics of the group that you might be serving before you launch in and, mm -hmm. and go into that area or, or, or the type of dentistry you might be offering? Is there competition already out there? Could you be doing something else? Could you be adding value, your value added point um, to it? So it's the, often we, human nature being what it is, we will um, approach it from our perspective rather than the customer's. And the, the minute you switch that, that's when you start to see success because you're, you're responding to needs and wants out there from the basis of your expertise. So it's not just talking about, you know, my clients, what next and why. I have no idea how to deliver it, but I'm going to try and find some products. That's not it. It's about my clients want X and Y. Do I have a matching expertise? And what can I give them that is differentiated in the market that will give me the edge? Yeah, I think it's so important, isn't it? Because we can't be all things to all people. And I think the earlier we understand that, the better it is, I think. <laughs> Unfortunately, for a lot of people, they spend 30, 40 years of their life trying to find that answer. So they really do struggle in their business. Sure. Thanks, Hiro. So... You know, can you share, you know, we are almost coming to the end of um, the one hour, the time flies when you're having fun. Um, you know, five key steps for driving lasting success in your business. Okay, so the, for me and everything that I've done in my life with myself, my clients, I've narrowed down five things too. And this sort of, the first one is very akin to your your subject matter, which is about a winning mindset. It's so, so important as a business owner to have that winning mindset. Um, you could have fantastic products, but if you don't have that mindset that will help you ride the storm, that will help you um, come up with new ideas, creativity, all of that, you are not going to succeed. And then I've already alluded to the fact that you need in addition to the winning mindset, you need some winning products. And the winning product is not what you think is winning, it's what your clients want from you. Um, it's having the right, third one is having the right foundations in your business. And by that, I mean that it's also in this age that we live in, we are constantly told on you know, social media and everywhere else, bombarded with the idea that everyone can succeed. You just gotta go out and sell your wares. Well. You can go out and sell your wares and sometimes you will have some immediate success. But if you don't put the foundations in place in your business, you are not going to succeed. And by that, just the analogy is, you know, build a house with dodgy foundations. It will stay up for a while. Then the cracks will start to show. You might patch them up. But if you don't really address the fundamental problems, that house is going to fall down around you. And so will your business. So that's number three, a very, very important aspect of it. Number four is keeping your eye not only on your business, but all that's going on around you. So keeping an eye on your, the internal and external environment. Um, it's very, very common to get so engrossed in your own business that you forget what's going on around you. And before you know it, the landscapes change People are offering other things. Your clients are moving away from you. And what started off as a really successful business is no longer successful. And then the final one I would say is having the right structures and systems in place for, so that you set it up so that you can scale your business. However good your product or service, you are never really going to make a success of it unless you can step back from it. You know, other, otherwise it's just a, long grind you may have money in the bank but if you can't if you if your health isn't good enough or you don't have time to enjoy it what's the point of it sure thanks Hiro. in a very short few words can you tell me two key steps to ensure that someone can stay ahead of competition okay two very quick no pressure <laughs> be clear it's easy be clear of your target audience and their needs be clear who your ideal client is and their needs and respond to them with your products and services. Is that brief enough? <laughs> <laughs> of course, you know, um, I have to say, this is how I put um, Hiru on my um, book launch. <laughs> Hiru, I think I want you to speak. <laughs> so, you know, it's, Hiru is used to this coming from me, I guess. <laughs> Thank and she, you. By the way, what the audience don't know is she gave me two minutes notice. <laughs> 
wanted to do it. <laughs> mm. Thank you so much, Hiru. It has been fun. And, uh, you know, we have many more questions. So pe people who are on Zoom, please stay back. And, uh, you know, uh, we will be, uh, you know, answering so many more questions uh, with time. Um, and it was really a pleasure, Hiru. So before um, we go forward, let me introduce the speaker for the next time. It will be the episode 44, protect, Protecting Emotional Wellbeing in Relationships. That is on the 5th of June at 2 o'clock UK time, not 3 o'clock. I repeat, it's at 2 o'clock UK time and Sri Lankan Indian time, it is at 6.30. Please take note, we are changing the time. And it will be with Jihene Rnarbet, clinical psychologist and assistant professor at an American university and UAE. So I would hope you can join us again for that as well. Uh, before we wind up, I pass it to Rohan Mehra to give the vote of thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Menika, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, Hiro, I feel lucky then in front of you that I was given a one day's notice that I'm supposed to speak at that book launch. So <laughs> comparatively, I'm luckier as compared in that. But uh, thank you so much for those pearls of wisdom. I feel this is perhaps one of the most candid conversations that I've seen in a long time. And I feel the major reason behind that is because it's coming from your own experiences. It's coming from your heart. And uh, as was quite rightly put in one of the chats, it's not that easy to share your problems. It's very easy to share laurels. So to have that courage to share your problems and share what you've gone through, I mean, kudos to you for that. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Uh, Menaka started today's session wherein she said that, uh, you know, she can remember a court and once she speaks about that court, she remembers you. I mean, throughout this entire uh, hour, I guess I can remember quotes and quotes and quotes when I go through this conversation, you know, so right from when the going gets tough, the tough gets going, need is the mother of invention, uh, change is the only constant, I, I guess the list is endless, you know, so I mean that clearly showcases that uh, your entire uh, experience that you shared did not just encompass us to understand one area, but it covered so many facets. So thank you so much once again for sharing those lovely words with us and making us more knowledgeable, making us know things that we may already know, but we weren't that conscious about. And me being me, right, I have to end with a small couplet before I thank everybody. So uh, yeah, this is something I just wrote in the last, pretty much like in your situation in the last two minutes. So when the going gets tough, the tough gets going. It's your responsibility to keep on rowing. We are an outcome of what we have been sowing. Resistance can have different meanings without many knowing. Optimism is the key, but realism is what does the towing. Life gives you setbacks, but it's the mind that needs to keep growing. Love so it. On that, on that <laughs> note, Thank you so much to the audience. We are not ending. We have a huge Q&A and fun time to yet go. But thank you so much for being a part of this platform. Thank you so much for coming week after week and making this platform what it is. Thank you so much once again and hope to see all of you in the next session. Thank you. Take care. Thank you so much, uh, Rohan, as ever, for those beautiful words. And once again, a huge thank you for my friend, Hiru, uh, for agreeing to be the guest speaker on this uh, platform. And for people who are listening to us on uh, Facebook, a couple of reminders from next week onwards, we would be going live at two o'clock in the UK time and 6.30 India, Sri Lankan time. The other thing I want to a humble request for you. If you feel these um, lives or these videos are, you know, valuable for you, please do subscribe and support us on our YouTube. Thank you so much for everyone who is uh, listening to us on Facebook. We will be hopefully uh, joining you again next week, same time, same place, to speak about protecting emotional well-being in relationships. Until then, be happy, stay safe, and keep smiling.